Welcome to one of the world's great museums, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Russia. The museum collection began with Queen Catherine the Great in 1764, and it's been open to the public for the last 170 years. For people outside Russia, it isn't easy to get here. But even if you can, the vast majority of the museum's three million artifacts are off limits and known mainly to scholars. And the Jewish treasures of the museum have never been widely known. We'd like to invite you to join us for a rare tour and for a glimpse of Jewish history and culture as they appear in the treasures of the Hermitage. At first glance, these clay vessels look like ordinary bowls, the kind you'd use for soup or cereal. A closer look reveals intricate inscriptions in Aramaic, not the kind of thing you'd find in an ordinary soup bowl. These bowls are 1,400 years old, and they weren't meant for food at all. They had a different purpose, warding off demons. Around 600 CE, Jews lived side by side with Christians and Zoroastrians in the country we'd now call Iraq, which was then part of the Sasanian Empire. And this was a rich world of Jewish life and scholarship, the one that produced the Babylonian Talmud. People there, like people today, were concerned with protecting themselves against diseases, calamities, and troubles of various kinds. These manifestations of misfortune were imagined as demons, creatures of the underworld who brought specific kinds of bad luck. If you wanted to ward them off, one way to do it was with an incantation bowl. This was a kind of folk magic. A bit later on, when the new religion of Islam began to spread, it tried to eradicate traditions like this one, which seemed pagan. Jewish law also frowned on these practices citing chapter 18 of the book of Deuteronomy, which bans any kind of witchcraft. Let no one be found among you who consigns his son or daughter to the fire, reads the biblical text, or who is an augur, a soothsayer, a diviner, a sorcerer, one who casts spells, or one who consults ghosts or familiar spirits, or one who inquires of the dead. For anyone who does such things is abhorrent to God, and it is because of these abhorrent things that the Lord your God is driving them out from before you. But despite that ban, Jewish magic bowls were popular in and around Babylon for hundreds of years. People were still using them as late as the 9th century. And interestingly, it wasn't just Jews. In fact, scholars now believe that of the approximately 1,000 bowls that have been found so far, two-thirds were created by Jews for non-Jews. The bowls were first inscribed with an incantation in the Aramaic language, then used in a magic ritual, and then buried under the threshold of a house or in a corner. They were supposed to prevent demons from coming in. Most of the homes where bowls have been uncovered didn't belong to Jews. They belonged to Zoroastrians, members of the majority religion of the Sasanian Empire, and in some cases they belonged to Christians. These people ordered the bowls from Jewish artisans. The names of many customers appear on the bowls. Some are Jewish, like Safra, son of Chana, but many others aren't, like Ahu, son of Machlafta, or Mirduch, daughter of Hoz Mirduch, or Bachranduch, daughter of Idi. How do we know that it was Jews who painted these bowls? The spells are in Aramaic, a language that wasn't used only by Jews. But the inscriptions were written in Hebrew characters, in a script that resembles the one used in the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. And the bowls often include Hebrew quotations from the Book of Psalms, from the Torah, or from Nevi'im, the books of the prophets. Sacred manuscripts written on parchment were expensive. It was much easier to commission an incantation bowl. All you had to do was go to the market and buy an ordinary clay bowl, like the kind that was commonly used at the time to serve wine. 
Then you found a Jewish scribe and matched the spell to the problem you wanted to solve. One bowl in the Hermitage opens with a list of misfortunes, including pains and illnesses, demons, satans, and tormentors. It goes on to say, May Mahlefana, son of Rewita, be sealed at his four sides, on his right and his left, in front of him and behind him, so no tormentors will afflict him. The spell ends with the ritual Hebrew words, Amen, Amen, Selah, and a final command, Go away and depart, evil demon. Some bowls make reference to the demon of fever, for example, while others mention epilepsy and cataracts. Some offer protection from the evil eye and the destruction of the house. Others are intended to ward off deaths in infancy or childbirth, which were thought to be the work of the female demon, Lilith. Images of the demons appear on some of the bowls. Jews often imagined demons with birds' feet instead of arms and legs. It was believed that evil forces took the form of creatures that were half human, half bird. If you found bird footprints under your bed, for example, it was a sign that a demon had paid you a visit during the night. The specific demons that caused misfortune were often shared by Jews and their non-Jewish neighbors. For example, the demon Ashmedai, the prince of demons, who's familiar in the Jewish tradition, actually originated in the Zoroastrian religion. So the demons might have been cosmopolitan, not limited to one religious community, but the forces of light that the incantation bowls appeal to for help, all of these are Jewish. The spells sometimes mention rabbis by name, and we also find references to three angels named Senoi, Sansenoi, and Semangelov. These three are familiar from Jewish mystical traditions where they appear as magical protectors. But the incantation wasn't just about the content or the meaning of the words. The Hebrew letters themselves were thought to have a protective power. The spell was also written in a spiral so that when the demon was reading, it would feel dizzy. The shape of the inscription, the way words wind around an image of a demon, this seems to bind the evil creature, hemming it in, preventing it from harming the residents of the home. The bulls sometimes spelled words incorrectly on purpose to further confuse the forces of evil. In some cases, the letters on the bulls aren't real letters at all, but a kind of crude graphic imitation, squiggles that only resemble handwritten text. This was also a deliberate attempt to confuse the demons and get them to turn around and leave. One strange detail is that the bowls are always found buried upside down. We don't know why. Maybe because their message was intended for inhabitants of the underworld, it made sense to have the writing facing downward. Or maybe this was done to ensure that no one else could read them so the spells didn't lose their power. In any case, it was considered bad luck to touch these bowls unnecessarily or to remove them from the house. Today, Jewish incantation bowls can be seen not only by ancient demons, but by any visitor to the Hermitage Museum. It's true that most of us can't read the spells inside these bowls or understand them. Then again, maybe that's for the best. Thank <laughs> you.